but of course you cannot bring an entire population in a place if you're not sure it's going to be safe um and of course there were some uh, wild animals leopard primarily but most of the wild beasts were in what we now know as akagera so the valley and the hills uh were um were pretty much uh, safe for uh, um, for you know establishing um, uh, small villages uh, without too much uh, disturb from uh, the animals. At that time, of course, uh, there were the pygmies living already in the region. They are the autochthon indigenous people. And then some historians say that the other major ethnic group uh, came primarily from East, uh, sorry, from West Africa. Primarily, they say Ghana and Nigeria. Of course, there are so many uh, uh, articles, books that you can read. There is so much research to be done on this particular topic, uh, but genetic um, uh, genetic samples uh, they obviously obviously because there's been so much time a long time since they left uh, of course they say they primarily are from uh, ghana but again because they lived in the region for so long and they have separated from the wrong people it could be might be far off just uh you know uh just um Maybe another country was their own country. <laughs> it's very, it's up to debate at this point. Um, uh, but same for the Watusis, they were uh, from elsewhere, they were from up north. We might speak about more on that with the Honda's Tales, because um, it's, it's uh, very long and complex in, on its own. Uh, the um, uh, the origin of the Watusi's people, where they come from, what they do. Um, what we know for certain is that they assimilated the language of the people that they met there because it was definitely more efficient for a hundred people to learn the language of the people who were speaking there rather than them teaching their own. Uh, it's definitely more effective. But what they brought with them was uh, their architecture, they brought with them uh, their um, taste for uh, geometry. Uh, they brought with them, they brought with them numbers, they brought with them monotheism, which is basically the uh, praying one God. Uh, they brought with them the cows, obviously, uh, they would know as well. Very important, the calculation of the days of the week, uh, the the um, calculation of uh, the passing of time by looking at the moon mostly, and the change of season, the months of the year were 12, the days of the week were seven. Very, very important to showcase the fact that for certain, they, this population came above the Sahara because at that time, uh, those uh, 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 those way of calculating time were uh, ac across uh, the board. Uh, primarily used in the North Africa, Mediterranean uh, region, because in some other parts of the world, they uh, they calculate time differently. So this just shows how important it is that they uh, definitely come uh, from, from up north, where they were exposed to the same uh, cultures where numerology, and uh, as astronomy was uh, was the same. So we have the age of Muami, which of course in another video I'll explain in detail the name of each king for each uh, year, or should I say for each dynasty, sorry. 
and uh, is compared to, um, we'd say, Greek expansion, and uh, and also the time when Rome started the monarchy. Because not many people know, but mar but Rome started off as a monarchy and became um, a republic later on, and then empire until it failed. Uh, while Greece never became a monarchy per se, because the Greek people at that time, they were highly um, uh, close to uh, their police affiliation, which means that they only cared about uh, city affairs. They didn't care about Greece as a whole, but they cared about their own affiliation to a specific uh, tribe, we should say. Like the Spartans cared about the Spartans, the Athenians cared about the Athenians, and the Cretes only about the Cretes. <laughs> so there was never like a king of Greece per se. Um, because they they came together only when there was uh, a major threat coming from outside, but they were very independent as a people. Um, uh, while the Watusis, in a way, in the age of Mohammed, they were all under one king, on under one rule, one Elohim, one everything. Well, then we come to the age of Magna Grecia between 500, 400, 480 BC, uh, where Magna Grecia is the peak of Greek um, uh, civilization because they exported their philosophy, their culture, the way of living in other parts of, uh, of the Mediterranean region, specifically in southern Italy, in a region called Apulia. Uh, they have a very, very strong uh, Greek uh, uh, influence or in Calabria as well. Of course, in some parts of what we know as southeastern Europe, like Croatia, Slovenia, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, although the Romans were the one who actually been there more in those uh, in those countries. And the Maya Greece obviously went went to Sicily. They went to some parts of North Africa as well, but majority of the Magna Gre uh, Magna Grecia was primarily on the other coast of Europe. Uh, North Africa was touched a little bit, but definitely they went more to Israel, and that's why a lot of the um, later text of uh, Christianity are written in Greek, because Greek at that time was English uh, of the world. Everyone had to speak and write Greek in order to make commerce, uh, or to write poetry in order to be read by other uh, uh, intellectuals around the world. So the New Testament, the one that is now uh, re written, uh, sorry, read by everyone as the gospel was, uh, well, of course, it was written at the beginning Aramaic, but a lot of it was lost, but it was translated in Greek to make sure the diaspora was able to read it because at that time not everyone was able to keep to the um, Hebrew roots and knowing Arabic and know the modern Hebrew that we know that people know today so a lot of young people they spoke and wrote in at school in Greek so the way to make sure that the uh, good novel of Yeshua was spread across the world was to write this in uh, Greek the same way now the gospel 
is mostly translated in English, probably second is close is Spanish um, in, in terms of um, reach and not of uh, how many people actually speak it. Because in terms of reach, uh, definitely Spanish and English are very close. French following it because there are some uh, countries around the world who might still uh, use French as their second language. So on this um, digression of the Magna Grecia, we understand that Greek was the English of the time. Many people in the diaspora of the Israel spoke and wrote in Greek. That's why the gospel was written in Greek. And it was the time where the police and democratic, um, uh, in a way, Republic of Greece reached its peak. Um, while in Watusi, between four, um, 1400 and 1600 AD, so we're talking about Renaissance period in Europe, they were expanding uh, their territories. Uh, they, they established um, stronger uh, kingdoms in, in Burundi, which uh, is the twin of, of Rwanda in terms of dynasty and the way they um, approach things with obviously some clear similar similarities and, and clear differences which might be explored on another episode then we also had a small uh, uh, strongholds in southwest uganda uh, some people might know the um, kingdom angola and then Northwest uh, Tanzania was another important um, section and Northeast Congo. But again, those territories were mostly vassal territories that didn't have any political independence. They were just uh, provinces where people went there to live um, and to make pasture, it was they were not established as separate kingdoms. The, most of those territories were under the crown of Nyanza, which was the capital of the kingdom of Rwanda. Burundi was the only exception where they, uh, for 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 some time, had their own independence, at least um, from a social. Uh, and political standpoint, although uh, their culture was impossible to descend from uh, the Kingdom of Rwanda because they were all the same people who came from the same place. Simply, they wanted to have some more independence because they established such a efficient, uh, efficient monarchy on their own that uh, it was superfluous for them to have uh, a king so far away. So they had their own Muami. Uh, although some historians say it was more a, a figure in a, a symbolic figure uh, attending spiritual uh, duties uh, because the, the real everlasting king is always, of course, uh, the most high Elohim and the, these kings were just administrating what uh, a human ruler could do, just... Uh, uh, the administration of lands, going to war against enemies, just to have a, a figure, a leader figure, but the uh, where in Kingdom of Rwanda the Muami had also a more political figure in Burundi for a long time, it was mostly the messenger in a way between the Almighty and the people, but then in later uh, centuries, instead, uh, between the later 1600, early 1800, for sure, it was a political figure in his own rights as the Muami of Rada. So when uh, Magna Grecia arrived at this peak, Rome was established into a republic. So the last king of Rome, uh, you know, died in 500. 509 in BC, and so shortly after, they established the First Republic. Uh, and during the Republic, it was the time where Rome really expanded. They went to 
creates so many provinces around uh, Europe, they uh, at some point uh, <laughs> um, had the entire Europe and North Africa under their rulership. So when Rome is starting off to in climb on the ladder of success, Greece started to have some problems. It's 483, uh, 323, we see the Persian Wars, the very <laughs> famous wars that we also see in movies, action movies, when we see the Persians, Xerxes, Darius, going against the Greeks. Because at that time, the Greeks were seen as an under underdeveloped civilization, where the Persians were the the most sophisticated it was the east against the west but in a very uh, peculiar way that we as as nowadays we not we could not understand because nowadays we see the west against the east and we see uh we perceive in a way i don't personally but many people perceive uh middle east as underdeveloped and uh, and uh, uh, in a way, uh, holding on uh, inadequate or old-fashioned values, old-fashioned ways, while the West is the place to go because uh, they have technology, they have what they perceive as democracy, etc. While at that time, it was the opposite. The East was the place of flamboyance, liberty, freedom, in their own way, and rights. And then the West was the place where people were still living in tents and fighting with swords, um, while the Persian army had uh, archery, they had uh, elephants, it was it was uh, something that, that no one could expect the level of uh, um, detail in everything they did. Everything was elegant, colorful, the spices, uh, very sophisticated civilization but at that time they were pagans themselves they had a pantheon of deities depending you know but uh, very sim similar to the Babylonians type of deities uh, so in that in that part they were similar because they had the same um, religion in, a, in the sense of pantheism, the difference was maybe Asian uh, paganism is more uh, esoteric and, see, and is built on secrecy, while Greek uh, religion is mostly built on the sense of guilt and, and the, the gods are there to uh, trick them into something. Uh, they are always involved uh, in their daily life, while in Persian, is, is Eastern religion, it was mostly esoteric. Knowing the, the will of the gods was very difficult. You had to discern it with magic. Everything was hidden and occult. That's why we have the word occult. But um, at that time, they won the Persian Wars, very surprisingly, although they were in small numbers, because they had um, a high sense of honor. They didn't want someone else to come and take their land. Of course, at some point they would fail in this, in this, um, uh, in the, in in this um, will of. Um, of keeping Greece for the Greeks, but at that time they won. They won. And the same thing happened between 1600, 1618 and 1894, where at that time 
the Burundi uh, reached the peak of their uh, so semi-independent kingdom, and also the Watusis uh, reached their peak. Uh, but what happened is that in the late 1800s, they, all the Watusis were faced with one of the most uh, difficult uh, military um, uh, opposition coming from the north. The uh, the the um, the problem of that time was that a lot of countries had started to ban the purchase and the sale of slaves. So slave hunters became more and more agitated because their business was starting to crumble, and to go and and go more east to to uh, to kidnap uh, indigenous people to then bring them to the Americas, both north and south, uh, to work in the plantations at that time. But what they didn't know is that they were up against a people who were highly motivated as much as, uh, as they would say, rudimental they have pushed away an entire army with simple weapons because at that time we already see uh the, the even in regions as north africa the artillery was uh very sophisticated because they bought them or took them from european countries so we see rifles we see pistols we see rudimental bombs, while Rwabugiri and uh, Gisabo, Rwabugiri that was king of Rwanda at that time, and Gisabo that was king of Burundi at that time, and together with other uh, nobility of the uh, nearby countries who were living outside, they created an army to oppose uh, the menace coming from the Arabs. And Wabugiri, very, very, very important figure because it just transcends uh, the borders of Rwanda uh, and is the hero of all Watusi's period. Uh, because the Watusi's people, of course, in modern day, um, how in modern day concepts between country and nationality, uh, a lot of the Watusi's are then divided by what we call modern day borders. And so some Watusi's are citizens of Burundi, some, citizens, some are citizens of Congo, some citizens of Rwanda, some are citizens of Uganda, some are citizens of Tanzania, but there are still Watusi's. And Wabugiri is the hero of all of them because he has, he had the ability to push away one of the greatest threats uh, to one's liberty. And uh, not only he protected the borders against the slave hunters for his own people, but also for the other indigenous people as well. Uh, because it's very noted in historical um, books and historical uh, accounts that in West Africa, a lot of uh, tribes uh, were were not resist, reticent in selling their enemies to the slave hunters. Um, something that in in the Great Lakes didn't happen because the Rabugiri was of the idea that anyone in his kingdom, regardless of his nationality, should be should be free because no one should be ever ever be a slave, especially. Uh, those who know from uh, generations back uh, what the hardship of slavery is, uh, because it's a mark that you can highly, uh, highly take off of you, because it's highly um, traumatic, and you pass down that trauma. So he didn't want anyone 
of, uh, of his subjects, regardless if they were Watusis or not, to be sent to, to the Americas and be slaves. So he was a great, great leader. He was um, just um, amazing. Uh, because other leaders in other uh, uh, parts, like in West Africa, didn't really care. They just saw, sold their enemies, sold or sold simply people who were not from their tribe um, in exchange of weapons, in exchange of candy bars. Yeah. They, they, yeah. So Rob Giri, emblematic figure uh, because of that. And also because when he fought against the Arabs with the Gisabo, in a way, he became emperor once again. So he united all the Watusi people under his rulership and he could have passed down the empire to his son. Uh, but unfortunately, there was a coup, a Rushoncho, so Rutarin, well, his, his uh, beloved son was deposed and he uh, committed suicide not to be taken alive. And uh, his stepbrother, Musinga, became king in his stead, but in a way, for sure, it was more um, uh, a Manchurian candidate because his mother, his uncles were running the show. So, when we see that the uh, Rabugiri is pushing away the threat coming from the north, it's very similar in a way to the Persian Wars. And then his uh, pinnacle of greatness when he united all the Watusi people once again under one rule, like it was at the time of Gihanga, is similar to Alexander Magnus. Alexander Magnus was the closest thing to a Greek emperor, although he was from Macedonia. So he was not Greek by blood, but he was Greek by culture because Macedonia was um, a region which was highly uh, occupied by uh, Greeks. So he was probably Greek by blood, but Again, he lived in another region, same as we could say with Stalin, that he was Russian by culture, but his, um, his um, uh, heritage was from Georgia. So he was a Georgian uh, guy. Yeah, it's very interesting how <laughs> some rulers, they're not even from that place. But anyways, um, Alexander Magnus um, conquered most of the East and North Africa. So took some of the territories that the Persian themselves were ruling and the same people who were attacking Greece at that time then became under him. So it was a big victory for the Greeks who could pay, pay back you know, the, um, the Persians who at first wanted to conquer them, but then they were the one who were conquered, for now, at least, for now. And Alexander Magnus is the father of many dynasties, father in the sense that he uh, gifted big portions of his, of his kingdom at the time of his death. And one of the key kingdoms that he gifted is the, is the, um, province of Egypt, one of the richest countries in terms of gold, in terms of literature, in terms of mystic knowledge and magic. And, he, and one of his generals, Ptolemyo, became the founder of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Ptolemaic dynasty is the same dynasty that will birth none other than Cleopatra. Ptolemaic dynasty is very important 